As you've learned in the past, living organisms contain the basic molecules of life. Molecular biology neatly ties the chemistry and biology together, ties it up with a bow, and gives you a pretty little package filled with bite-sized goodness. Topic 2 is all about the chemicals that make up living organisms and the essential processes that make them function. Think carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and a few other things as well. Remember last year you discussed human physiology and learned about the enzymes in the digestive system. Or remember when you had that ninth grade health class and the silly teacher made you calculate how many calories in a gram of protein or what the basic building blocks of proteins were? Well, we've come back to the topic of proteins. There's so many rad things that proteins can be used for. Proteins come in all shapes and sizes and are found all over the body. Personally, when I think of proteins, I think of building muscles, drinking protein shakes, and bodybuilders that want to gain large amounts of muscle mass. Rawr! Additionally, I think of hair and somebody getting a keratin treatment to straighten their hair or a perm to make their hair curly. There are definitely other things to associate proteins with, like spider webs, collagen, hormones, immune cells, and lastly, genes, which are the instruction manuals for the proteins we need. So in topic 2.4, we dive into the bucket filled with proteins. Our essential idea here is that proteins have a very wide range of functions in living organisms. Stay patient, don't let yourself get denatured and all out of sorts, and off we go. As we begin, we have to get a few things straight about proteins. Some of this should hopefully be reviewed from both 9th and 10th grade and links up nicely to portions of topics 1 and 6. So how do we get a protein? Well, children, gather around. Let me tell you the story about how a protein is born. First, your DNA has a bunch of genes on them. The DNA gets read, and mRNA is formed in a process called transcription. The mRNA leaves the nucleus and ventures into the cytoplasm, where it encounters a ribosome, which as you totally remember, can be free-floating or found on rough endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes read the mRNA, which is made up of genes in a process called translation. Each gene contains the instructions for exactly one polypeptide sequence. A polypeptide is a long chain made up of many individual molecules called monomers. These monomers are each called amino acids. So in short, proteins are long chains of linked polypeptides, which are large chains of amino acids. These amino acids get held together with special bonds called peptide bonds. As you can see on the slide, there are 20 different amino acids that are universal to all living organisms. Just 20. Well, there are two modified variants found in certain organisms, but 20! Amino acids all share a common basic structure with a central carbon atom bound to the following. First, it's bound to an amine group, which is NH2, a carboxylic acid group, the COOH, a hydrogen atom, and a variable side chain, which is the R. Naturally, the variable group is a part of the amino acid that is different for each of the 20. Additionally, it's worth mentioning that one very important amino acid, hydroxyproline, is a modified amino acid requiring vitamin C, better known as ascorbic acid, to biosynthesize collagen. And collagen's found in tendons, ligaments, skin, and blood vessels. So this is an example of how our diet and nutrition is also important for amino acid formation. Now that you know the basic chemistry behind proteins and how they are made, let's discuss this further in depth. Polypeptides are molecules consisting of many amino acids linked by peptide bonds. The polypeptides can contain any number of amino acids, though chains of fewer than 20 amino acids are usually referred to as oligopeptides rather than polypeptides. Two amino acids linked together are called dipeptides, with di meaning two. Take insulin, for example. Insulin is a small protein that contains two polypeptides, one with 21 amino acids and the other with 30. Did you catch that? Two polypeptides, one with 21 amino acids and the other with 30. This is why proteins are so complex. Think about the math. There are 20 different amino acids that you can choose from that have different R groups. These R groups have distinct chemical properties, which you can see in the chart to the right, like polar or nonpolar, and positively or negatively charged. And they cause the protein to fold and function differently according to its specific position within the polypeptide chain. As most natural polypeptide chains contain between 50 and 2,000 amino acids in various arrangements, and some up to 30,000, 
the mathematical possibilities for combinations are extreme. So many different outcomes. You can see the chart here, the guide to 20 amino acids. You probably want to get started memorizing the amino acids and their chemical structures because it's a lot. Just kidding. You don't need to know them by memory. You just need to be able to classify the amino acid chemical properties based on the R group properties from the slide before. The slide before is super duper helpful for this. I've already mentioned the structure of amino acids and how amino acids are held together, but let's take a closer look. First, two amino acids bond in a covalent bond through a chemical reaction known as a condensation reaction. The condensation reaction involves the amine group, which is the NH2, of one amino acid and the carboxyl group, the COOH, of another. The amine group loses a hydrogen and the carboxylic acid group loses a hydroxyl group, which is the OH. This leaves two H's and an O, better known as H2O. Water is removed, just like in all condensation reactions, and a new bond is formed between the two amino acids called a peptide bond. You can see the bottom image how this reaction specifically occurs. One skill that you need to know how to do is to draw the molecular diagrams, like the bottom image, to show the formation of a peptide bond. This is a great link to organic chemistry. Proteins can come in all shapes and sizes, and these macromolecules have four different levels of structure that you should know. We will spend the next two slides discussing. The order that the amino acids are connected is muy muy importante. The order of the amino acid sequence is called the primary structure and determines the way the chain will fold. The different amino acid sequences will fold into different configurations due to the chemical properties of the variable side chains, aka the R group. The amino acid sequences will commonly fold into two stable configurations called secondary structures. Alpha helices occur when the amino acid sequence folds into a coil slash spiral arrangement. Beta pleated sheets occur when the amino acid sequence adopts a directionally oriented staggered strand conformation. Wow, that's a mouthful. Both alpha helices and beta pleated sheets result from hydrogen bonds forming between non-adjacent amine and carboxyl groups. When no secondary structure exists, the polypeptide chain will form a random coil conformation. You can see in the images here where you have an alpha helix like a coil and a beta pleated sheet like a folded sheet of paper. The overall three-dimensional configuration of a protein is referred to as the tertiary structure of a protein. The tertiary structure of a polypeptide chain will be determined by the interactions between the variable side chains. These interactions may include hydrogen bonds, disulfide bridges, ionic interactions, and polar associations, among others. There are two main classes of tertiary protein structure, fibrous proteins and and globular proteins. Fibrous proteins are generally composed of long and narrow strands and have a structural role. They are usually something. Examples of proteins with a fibrous tertiary structure are collagen, keratin, fibrin, actin, and elastin. On the other hand, globular proteins generally have a more compact and rounded shape and have functional roles. They do something or perform a function. Examples of proteins with a globular tertiary structure are enzymes, hemoglobin, and insulin. The last level of protein structure is quaternary structure. Not all proteins have this quaternary level. This type of structure is found in proteins that consist of more than one polypeptide chain linked together. The interactions between polypeptide and prosthetic groups, which are inorganic compounds involved in the protein, determines the specific quaternary structure. Hemoglobin is an example of a protein with quaternary structure with two alpha chains and two beta chains. The interactions between these alpha and beta chains causes it to form its unique shape. You can see the example of hemoglobin on the right, as well as the example of primary through tertiary protein structure on the bottom left. One application relating to the structure of proteins is when proteins lose their structure, they get all funky. This is called denaturation. Specifically, denaturation is a structural change in a protein that results in the loss, usually a permanent, of its biological properties. Denaturation of proteins involves the disruption and possible destruction of both the secondary and tertiary structures. Since denaturation reactions are not strong enough to break the peptide bonds, the primary structure remains the same after a denaturation process. Denaturing the protein disrupts the normal alpha helix and beta sheets in the protein and uncoils it into a random shape. So to re repeat. Peptide bonds are strong. They do not get broken up and the primary structure is the same. Denaturation only occurs with the secondary and tertiary structures of the protein. Denaturing of proteins can usually be caused 
by a change in two of the key conditions, temperature and pH. Let me discuss them and then tie an example to each. With pH, amino acids are known as Zwitter ions, which are neutral molecules possessing both negatively and positively charged regions. Changing the pH will alter the charge of the protein which in turn will alter protein solubility and overall shape. All proteins have an optimal pH, which is dependent on the environment in which it functions. For example, stomach proteins require an acidic environment to operate, whereas blood proteins function best at a neutral pH. Environments outside this normal level make it so these proteins will not function efficiently or even at all. With temperature, the ideas are similar. High levels of thermal energy may disrupt the hydrogen bonds that hold the protein together. As these bonds are broken, the protein will begin to unfold and lose its capacity to function as intended. Temperatures at which proteins denature may vary, but most human proteins function optimally at a body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. If you've ever used a flattening iron or curling iron in your hair, you're probably denaturing the proteins using temperature for a temporary time period in order to get your hair to do something. Hair is protein, and by adding heat, you are denaturing the proteins. I have already mentioned how a protein is created, but let's recap again. In our DNA, we have specific sequences called genes. These genes each encode a polypeptide sequence. Once the DNA is transcribed, the ribosome will read the gene in a process known as translation. Each three-letter mRNA sequence tells the ribosome instructions on what the amino acid order is for the polypeptide. You will learn more about this when we discuss DNA and translation, but the main idea is that these genetic instructions create the order of amino acids, the number of amino acids in a polypeptide chain, and therefore, what a protein will be made up of. You can see there are some exceptions for the one gene equals one polypeptide that I just mentioned. Each individual contains one set of genetic code, better known as a person's genome. Well, each individual also has a proteome. The proteome is the totality of proteins expressed within a cell, tissue, or organism at a certain time. The proteome of any given individual will be unique, as protein expression patterns are determined by an individual's genes and environmental factors. It's important to understand that the proteome is always significantly larger than the number of genes in an individual due to a number of factors. Specifically, gene sequences may be alternatively spliced following transcription to generate multiple protein variants from a single gene, and proteins may be modified following translation to promote further variations. The key idea here, which you can see in the graph, is that each individual has roughly 20 to 25,000 genes, but the number of proteins we can create is a million or more. There are so many variations, and scientists even use computer algorithms to create proteins based on different combinations of amino acids. As I literally just mentioned, humans synthesize many different types of proteins that have so many different types of functions. Protein functions include structure, hormones, immunity, transport, sensation, movement, and enzymes. Oddly, there is a mnemonic for this, which you can see at the bottom. I will not repeat the mnemonic, and I will not go into depth about the examples of the types of functions because you can read, but you have to know these examples and the types of functions. Hopefully my presentation hasn't caused your brains to denature and that you recognize the importance of the macromolecules called proteins. There are so many links to our day-to-day -day lives with proteins, like grocery shopping, nutrition, beauty products, and yes, DNA. So go denature your hair a bit, drink a protein shake, and walk through a few spider webs. Stay woke to the bio, give a thumbs up, and pound the subscribe button. Yeah! As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info come from Biology for Life, Bionology, iBiology, and a few other smattering of places. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the IB Biology text, as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum, and this is used under a Creative Commons attribution and share alike license. So, peace out.